Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, our guest, I'm sure you've seen him. His video has gone viral. When I say viral, he is now about 4 million views on his latest video about April 8th. You're going to want to hear the message that he has about April 8th and why you should not ignore it. Well, what's happening April 8th? There is an eclipse, an eclipse of which there's an X or there's now an X going across the United States, one in 2017, and now in 2024, you're gonna to wanna to hear the warnings behind it, why it's happening and what you can do about it. Jim Staley, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so great to be on your program. So Jim, first of all, I wanna have the audience know who you are first. You are fascinated with NASA. I know we talked about that previously. You're fascinated with NASA, which is probably why you like you know, what's happening going on now, but how did you get to where you got to? Because you were born again, Christian. Now, did you always have a belief in Jesus? Did you grow up in a Christian home? How did that look for you? I, I actually grew up Catholic. I was a really good altar boy. And, uh, and then it was not until the sixth grade where the teacher began to teach that Adam and Eve was not a real people, they weren't real people. And my mom wasn't saved at the time. She was Catholic, but she said, no, I know that's not true. And she ripped us right out of the Catholic church. And then after that, my grandmother got saved in the charismatic uh, Catholic revival in the late seventies. Um, she became a Jesus freak like no other. Uh, my mom got saved. All of her siblings got saved. And then I got saved in, in 1986 at a Christian youth camp. Uh, then I kind of grew up kind of in a non-denominational background um, and was really involved starting Bible clubs, really into uh, uh, youth and leading youth uh, with the local uh, youth uh, group here and uh, youth organization. And then it wasn't until I got married in 2002, uh, I was married in 97. In 2002, I had a supernatural experience where I heard the voice of God first and last time in my life, not inside my spirit like I do now. It was audible during a church service where uh, God told me that, that when you pray, someone's going to stop you. And uh, people were just praying out loud. It was a prayer service uh, for a, a uh, family that went to our church that was having some tough times. And, uh, and so I, I went to pray anyway, about 25 minutes later, I kind of calmed down. Uh, after I heard the voice of God, I got out of my chair, went to the back, and I was so freaked out. But eventually I started praying. And sure enough, uh, a, a associate pastor stopped me and, uh, and told me uh, without saying a single word, it was clear. He was trying to tell me to stop. He just put his hand on my shoulder. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, Dave, pastor Dave, what happened? Why did you stop me? He said, I have no idea what you were praying, but God told me to stop you by just putting my hand on your shoulder. So I told him what happened to me. He freaked out. We've never had a supernatural thing like that happen in our church. So I, I just, he encouraged me to fast and pray. I'd never fasted before. What was that? But on the third day of my fast, uh, I was face down on my bed. I'll never forget this. And it was then I heard the voice of God again, except for this time it was on my spirit. And he, and he said, the hand on your shoulder was my shoulder. Go to these two people and they'll give you the rest of the interpretation. It was crazy. I felt like I was living out of the Bible. And uh, so I went to these two people. One of them I didn't know uh, hardly at all. Uh, I, they went to my church, but I'd never had a conversation with her. I called her up and said, Beverly, I, I know we don't know each other very well, but this is what happened. Do you by chance have an interpretation for me? And she said, yes, the hand on your, your shoulder represents the hand of God. He's pulling you in a different direction. The direction that he's taking you, it, you're not going to be accepted. And that, that was cryptic. What, what in the world did that mean? With, with the direction that I'm going to go, people aren't going to accept. What direction am I going? I went to the other person. They said the same thing, except they added that God's calling you from your church. Well, that was not okay because this was my family. I didn't have a single friend outside of our local church. Long story short, uh, three days later, uh, we decided uh, by God's instruction that we were going to leave our church for no reason. So we went to our pastor. We said, hey, in tears, this is what God's telling us to do. We don't know why, uh, but we're leaving. And uh, three days later, I got a call from a guy I'd never met in my life. And he said, hey, uh, I, I know we don't know each other, uh, but I do know your mom. I want to invite you to our Bible study. So I go to the Bible study. I've got my little NASB Bible under my arm and I'm, you know, apologetically been teaching, uh, you know, apologetics and defense of the Bible to a, a lot of even adults and, and youth for many years. I was very rehearsed in, 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 uh, in a lot of things, the Bible. I thought I knew the Bible, but I was there till two 30 in the morning as they clean my clock on every controversial subject that I could think of. And I had never looked at the Bible from this, uh, from the Hebraic original author's perspective. And I didn't know what to do with this. And so I spent the next several years 
uh, really researching, like, what does this mean? Like all of these things I've been looking at from a Western perspective. And, uh, and then I had this experience and this changed everything for me. I was sitting on the couch next to my wife, never forget this. And I'm studying Revel, uh, uh, not revelation Romans chapter three. And I was stuck. I'm like, what in the world does this mean? And I lean my head back and I'm just meditating about it. And I saw a vision for the first time in my life. Now I never had a vision. I didn't even know I was having a vision. I just imagined seeing this beautiful manicured grass and this uh, uh, footing of a wall, this like ancient ruins. And then uh, Jesus, Yeshua comes into the picture. And right about that time, my wife elbows me and she says, Jim, stop humming. And, and I'm like, what do you mean? I'm not humming. And, and, and we started laughing I, and, and she's like, yeah, you're humming. I'm like, I'm not humming. And we had this little fun argument. Well, that night I went to bed and Jennifer, if you could believe this, uh, my wife, of course, at the time we had three very, very young uh, children. And uh, she, she was, I woke up to her looking at me. Now I, I never wake up to my wife looking at me. She's always up before me. And uh, because we had young kids at the time and she said, Jim, what happened last night? And I said, what do you mean? What happened last night? She said, well, I woke up in the middle of the night I never on my side and I opened my eyes and there was a man uh, uh, standing, hovering over the top of you in the middle of the night. And I was like, what? And I, and I, I, I literally started to put two and two together. And my first thought, thought as a, as a, as a dumb guy was, why didn't you wake me up so I could see him? Right. That was my first thought. And then after I realized what was happening, I put two and two together because that night I had a dream that started exactly where the, where the vision left off. And Jesus comes in the picture. I'm in the picture, the camera angles from behind and telepathically Yeshua was telling me as he's going around the footing of this wall. And he's explaining to me, this was a gate. This was a window. This is how this got in this uh, condition. He was explaining to me why this building was in the condition that it was and what it used to look like. Now I didn't know what it meant at the time until I went back out to the same couch, sit on the same place with the same laptop, opened up Romans chapter three, and I read Romans chapter three, and I just understood it. And then I turned to Romans four, and I understood it. And then I started to pick up Hebrew idioms that were in the book of Romans that I didn't even know were Hebrew idioms. And I started to look them up and go, how do I know this? And I, I would Google it and find out that, oh my gosh, this is right. Uh, and so like God had given me a download of understanding Paul from his original Jewish background. Uh, and so that's really kind of how our ministry began. I, I started to uh, teach five, six, seven people in our family, a couple people that came by. And uh, within five years, we had 10,000 people watching live online. And uh, the, one of the largest ministries, fastest growing in the country in 2014. And uh, it was just all, uh, not because of me, but it was just God saying, hey, it's time to go back and do Bible things in Bible ways. Y'all have been interpreting my Bible from your American point of view, <laughs> not from the original author. And so long answer to your question, Jennifer, but but that is, uh, that's really kind of uh, how everything got started. When your wife saw this man standing over you, what did she say? I mean, did she say anything to this man to know that there's a third person in your bedroom? Yes. So it was a silhouette uh, of a man. So she didn't see any features outside of, it was very clear uh, that it was like some sort of an angel. And it was fascinating because her response was exactly like the ones in the Bible. She was terrified, completely terrified. And she literally closed her eyes and prayed that it would go away, opened it up. It was still there, closed her eyes, prayed that it would go away. And then eventually it was gone, uh, but she was scared out of her mind and she was afraid to wake me up. She just couldn't move. She was like paralyzed, if you will. Uh, so yeah, it was not a, a fun experience uh, for her. That is wild and amazing. Okay, now you said how Jesus began to show you what each part of this building was that used to be. For those who don't know Romans 2, 3, and 4, what was it? Well, what it was is, and to this day, I don't know exactly what the building was. I'm still waiting for, for God to give me a revelation of what he was showing me. But I don't think the building, that, that the ancient ruins was, was, was the point. The point was the foundation of our faith, okay, has been eroded to such a degree that we don't know uh, what, what, that this is where the gate is. This is where the door is. These are the windows. We don't know how the church was supposed to be formed and what it's supposed to look like because Rome took over. Uh, right. Very quickly, the Gentiles flooded the church in the four in the, 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 the uh, end of the second century, third century, fourth century, flooded the church, 
Roman uh, emperor got involved. That's never a good thing when you get a politician involved with with church. And uh, they completely- Say that again. Oh my, say that one more time. Right. It's never a good idea to get a politician involved with biblical things, Mm -hmm. with church. They're going to mess it up. That's why the framers said, let's separate the church and the state because they knew their history. You cannot get the state involved with the church. They'll screw it up every single time. And that's exactly what happened with the Roman church. It went from the biblical apostolic church that was very much formed out of a synagogue atmosphere. They just added the Holy Spirit to it, took out the traditions and doctrines of men, and the power of God showed up. They were operating under the Passover and the, and, and unleavened bread and all the feast days of, of the Lord that were all about Christ. And then the Roman church came in, stripped the church of all of its heritage, all of the feast day calendar. God's calendar was gone. They institute a new Roman calendar that came originally from paganism, and the rest is history, and we've never looked back. And so we've really been defrauded. Our ministry really is formed to teach people what I call the front of the book, like teach them how the front of the book, the Old Testament, and how it's the foundation of the entire new covenant. And when you really understand a God's prophetic calendar, when you read your New Testament, it's just going to blow your mind. Like it, it totally comes to life. The power shows up and you don't have to tell people, oh, by the way, you really should know Jesus. They come to you and say, hey, tell me what you got. I don't have that. I never seen anybody healed in my church before. Whatever you got, I want it. And uh, that's how it's really our lives are supposed to be lived. You know what? That's really good. And you mentioned something that a lot of Americans don't know. Um, The Western world um, doesn't know this either. And I'm glad you mentioned it, how you mentioned separation between church and state. Because a lot of the Western world believe that it means that the church can't put anything in the government, basically. But what it truly means is that the government is not supposed to tell the church what to do. Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate uh, because church people have kind of stayed out of politics. And that's honestly why we're in this mess. Uh, this country was completely and totally founded upon one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot. This country doesn't exist. If all the pastors in 1776 are not telling their congregations that are farmers to get your pitchforks, we need to go to war and protect this country and protect our towns and our provinces if and the colonies. If that doesn't happen, we don't have a war. It was the pastors that got on board and got involved in politics that, that, that said, we're done with this and our country was formed. And then after that, uh, the federal government, the formation of that and all of that, and, and the federal government began to uh, uh, trick pastors to stay out of politics in the way they did that was quite frankly through the 501c3. By, oh my goodness, say that again. Whew. Yes. I'm sorry, you're saying so much. That's so <laughs> true because we're not a 501. We are 508c1a. So yeah, so so uh, when you, what the government did was they said, look, let's create an entity that will give them tax-free status, even though they already have tax-free status. Uh, oh, we'll tell them that they don't have it mm-hmm. unless you play by our rules. And then if they break our rules, we can strip that that uh, 501 away and then they'll feel like they, they've lost their power, but we'll control them in the mind. And, and so they've, they've played this mind game, uh, quite frankly, with, with pastors for so long that now pastors are afraid out of their mind, even mm-hmm. though only I think one organization in the history of America has ever had their 501c3 stripped uh, because it's extraordinarily difficult to do. Pastors are afraid to talk about politics. They're afraid to speak the truth as if there is such thing in our lives as politics and religion. No, your politics is affected by your faith and your faith is affected by what you believe. People do what they believe and it's pastors jobs. We're losing our country. You know why? Because pastors aren't doing their job. We're voting for policy and people get confused on that. Unless pastors kind of who have been given the voice of articulation for their congregation, if we don't tell them, here's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in every category, then shame on us, then we deserve to be slaves. You mentioned you had one of the fastest growing churches in America. What was the name of the church and what happened to make that cease for a while? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a loaded question, isn't it, Jennifer? So thanks for that. Uh, in 2014, yes, we, we were growing leaps and bounds. We, we had 22 employees. We were, we were in eight different languages uh, broadcasting. It was, it was really out of control, uh, the amount of growth that we were having. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, the federal government showed up at my door and indicted me for something that had happened years, years prior when that when I was a financial planner in the market with the greatest stock market crash in history in 2008, 
I was cleared by the state of Missouri from any wrongdoing uh, or any criminal activity. And, uh, and then the federal government came along, finding out later that I was uh, targeted as a, uh, uh, in this indictment uh, because they have all the power in the world to indict you, your dog, your grandmother, all your children, if you don't play by their rules. And so I, my entire ministry crumbled. I went to jail, to prison for five years I spent in a federal prison. I didn't understand how God could allow all of this to happen but it was a miracle for me to realize that it ain't about me. It's about God. And, and when you get uh, falsely uh, slandered, false gossip or falsely accused, whether you go to prison or whether it's just by, you know, your friend or coworker and it's unjustified, God's required by his own law to bless you and to turn it all around for, for his glory and for your good. That's Romans eight twenty eight, Right. And so I was challenged as a pastor, as a leader, as a guy that was like literally at the top of his game, following God. And God said, nope, you're not doing this in a way that will bring the greatest glory to me. You're about to build a mega church. That's not what I want for you. Uh, mega churches are, are, are over with uh, in, in my kingdom, God says, and I want to do something different. And you don't know any other way to do this than to follow in the force and the footsteps of your forefathers. So I'm going to kill all this. And then I'm going to kill your pride. And then I'm going to reorganize you. Right. And then, and then I'm going to teach you how to follow me instead of feeling like uh, you're partnering with me. Uh, I want you to just stand one step behind me so that everything you do is successful because I never lose says the Lord. And so, so many of his leaders uh, get successful because God gives them a gift. And then we get big heads about it. And then God's like, oh man, I got to do this. I'm sorry, but this is how it's going to be. But once we, I came out and, and uh, you know, I became good friends with my judge, unbelievable story in that. Uh, and, and, you know, frequently we go out and, and catch up on, on ministry. He's a believer as well. But at the end of the day, Jim Staley was redefined. He was cut to the bone and he had to learn what, uh, what ministry really is and uh, what the compassion of Christ was. And so when, when all is said and done, the largest thing that I learned about going to prison and going through that entire experience is life is not about us. It's not about our comfort. It's not about what we want. We can't just define blessing as, as material things or when things are going great because nobody would know you know, we did, we will say, oh, this is a bad thing. And this is a good thing. But how do you know until it's over with, you know, Joseph thought it was pretty bad to go to prison. And then he ends up second in charge of all of Egypt. So was it a bad thing that we went to prison or was it a good thing? It was a bad at the moment, great afterwards. So uh, I learned very quickly that the American Christian idea of blessing is warped. It's completely warped. We don't have kingdom mindset and kingdom mindset means, Hey, if two thirds of the new Testament is only going to be written, if Paul goes to prison then Paul's going to prison because we need those two thirds of the new Testament. So, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that it was a rough road and now we're back. God's doing great things. I guess it's blessing. I feel blessed, but I, I'm not at a place where I'm able to say I mean, blessing or not. I don't know. I just want to follow God. Let him determine whether something's blessed or whether it's not, you know, I really love that. And I love how you compare yourself to Joseph in that aspect. Now, I just want to let you, well, I just want to ask the question because I know Joseph, while he was in prison, he had challenges, uh, but the Lord still worked through him. And like, you know, like we all know the story, the leader of Egypt saw favor in him. But for you, when you were in prison, how was it for you in prison? How did people treat you? And how did people treat you knowing that you were a born again Christian? Worst thing I ever did. Uh, was allow myself to be, everybody has a nickname in prison and mine was preacher. And uh, it's not a nickname that you give yourself. I was playing basketball the first week and uh, I was at a prison camp, right? So it, it was, it was more like an adult daycare facility for men. Uh, but I, I was playing basketball and I stole the ball from someone and a guy yells out and he goes, and he, he knew I was a pastor, former pastor. And he said, um, he's like, he's like, pastor, uh, uh, steal, steal. And he goes, no, thou shall not steal. Thou shall not steal. <laughs> and uh, he goes, go preacher. And the moment he said that it stuck. And the reason why it was such a horrible nickname is when you're in prison, uh, having the nickname preacher immediately invokes uh, certain pictures in people's mm. minds. And uh, 
and I was split down the middle. I had 50% of the prison that, that, that loved me and they, they knew I was authentic and real. And then the other 50% had very bad experiences with pastors. Yeah. And so I actually had a guy come up to me in the chow line once and just punched me twice right in the face for no reason. I never had a conversation with this guy. And my friend who was my bodyguard uh, pulled up on him afterwards. It was very intense, very, very intense. He wanted to fight me and he, he got him calmed down and come to find out. I just reminded him of a pastor that had him when he was a kid. Mm. And so he had all this bent up anger, possibly maybe that's why he went to prison, you know, and went through that lifestyle. I don't know. Uh, but I had a lot of bad experiences a lot of great experiences. A lot of people got saved. Unbelievable. I'm still in contact with people that, that are out of prison now uh, that totally gave their life over to the Lord. And so for that, uh, I, 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 I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share the gospel. But uh, but yeah, a hundred quest, a hundred stories just from my prison experience for sure. Okay. So you got out of prison and how did you get back on your feet? Because now you're on YouTube and you have your online ministry and you're excelling. So how did you transition from prison to back at it again? Yeah, you know, it was really difficult. It was the most emotional experience ever when I got out of prison. Uh, we actually made a video of it. My, uh, me and my wife did because we documented everything. Just the moment that we embraced uh, after five years, which was uh, crazy emotional. Um, you, you can't even imagine uh, to, to coming home and then having this massive international audience with incredible expectations that I immediately, like people were asking me to immediately, I just got out of prison and they're waiting for me to start a church. Right. And, uh, and I hadn't really embraced my children outside of a visiting room for five years, you know? So, uh, it took about six months. We started our organ, our ministry again, slowly, like literally I went from 22 employees to, to me. And so starting over in a living room with a small little camera, uh, it was like starting all over in my basement of my house in 2010. Uh, and, uh, and I began to live deja vu over again because I'd already been here, done that, except for now God had reformed his heart in me differently. It was a different spirit that was coming from me and uh, more in line with him. I still have a long way to go, but it was more in line with him. And so people began to kind of tune in again, and then slowly but surely, God began to bring people, amazing people, editors and admins, and, and, and now we've got nine employees, and, we, and we, it's slowly but surely just starting putting out content, and it became you know, better and better, and, and then all of a sudden, uh, we put out this, the Lord tells me to do a video on the solar eclipse. I started doing all this research on the solar eclipse, starting finding all kinds of prophetic things in the Bible, and then historical connections and patterns that were blowing my mind of potential world changing events that could happen after this uh, solar eclipse didn't know what to do. So we made this video and then it just went viral. I think it has three and a half million views in, in, a, in a few weeks. And then I followed up with another one of, of all these things that are happening on April 8th. And it has almost a million views in five days. And then I'm getting calls from television and radio stations all over the country. And it's just out of control right now. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, it's gone from like zero to a hundred miles an hour uh, in three short years. And now uh, I'm reliving uh, PFT, what we call PFT 1.0, Passion for Truth uh, Ministries 1.0 is just now 2.0 doing the same thing at an accelerated speed. So uh, for those of you out there, just want to give a, 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 a prophetic encouraging message. If you are struggling in your life, and you've got something going on in your life right now where you feel like you're going backwards uh, and you feel like you've done nothing wrong, but God, why am I experiencing this again? Let me just give you one encouragement. According to, to God's temple law, when the priest goes into the holy place, he feels like he's right there in the presence of God. And, and, and then all of a sudden he has to go back out to the altar and get the coal from the altar before he can go in there and then put it into the altar of incense for his prayers to be heard. So going out back to the altar feels like you're going backwards, but in reality, it's just part of God's plan. Backwards is forwards in his plan. So don't have doubt. God knows what he's doing. Your breakthrough is coming. Just trust the process. That is good. So that must have been Holy Spirit right now because that was a little off topic, but the Lord instilled that into you just right now. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Somebody needed that out there. Somebody did need that. Thank you so much. I know a lot of people actually need that message, actually. Before <laughs> we get to April 8th, I want to go back really quickly because it touched my heart when you said that you were away from your children. How was that for you? And how was that for your children and your wife, you being away so long from them, missing yeah. them grow up? You know, prison was was difficult for me, but it was far more difficult for my wife because she's she's homeschooling six children simultaneously without a husband stripped away from her. Uh, you know, our, our, our church, our, unfortunately, my leadership got caught up in some things and turned on us and stole everything, a whole nother story. But yeah, when, when it fell, it fell uh, in, in my life. And but it was it was emotionally traumatizing uh, for my children. They were very young at the time. Uh, I'll never forget this if I can say this without crying, but my five-year-old, my wife was looking for my five-year-old at the time. Her name was Kyla, couldn't find her, was getting hysterical and found her in my office. My, my whole office at home was still there and she was in my chair and she had pulled up a picture of her dad and just put it in front of her and was weeping. She was just weeping because she missed her dad. And, she, and that's the closest that she could get to me was sitting at my office chair, looking at my picture and uh, wow. So that was, mm. that was uh, emotional there. So that's been so long ago, yeah. but um, it was traumatizing and they would come up every other week and we would meet in the visiting room for like seven hours. And I would get to just put them on my lap and talk to them. We played games and, and it, and it was a beautiful time together. But that moment where we had to separate uh, every two weeks at the end of the visiting day was it was just gut wrenching. There was many times I would go back to my bunk and just cry, just cry, uh, you know, because uh, who wants to live in a life where the separation was the hardest part of prison? It wasn't prison. Uh, you know, God equipped me uh, with the personality to get along with a lot of people. And, uh, and once ministry developed in prison, then it, then it became just ministry in prison. Uh, it was a different lifestyle, but the separation from the children and my wife, oh, that was hard. That was hard. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that, was, that was difficult for sure. Wow. Well, you know, and like I said, I'm glad the Lord brought you out of that. I know it's an emotional topic. Let's go to a little bit kind of more happier yeah. um, or more, <laughs> more positive in a way, I guess, bittersweet, April 8th. Yeah. Now, everybody's talking about April 8th, and I know I told you earlier, I said, you're one of the very few people, if the only one who actually noticed that something did happen after the four blood moons. What, when did that start? When did it In start? 14 and 15. 14 and 15. You were the only one who actually said things actually did happen, just not the way that we expected it to, which is like yeah. most prophecy. Um, so could you just explain... How did you come to even learn about April 8th? What is April 8th? Why is it important? Well, I, I actually learned about it in prison because I was in prison in Marion, Illinois in 2017 during the total solar eclipse. And so when it happened and I went outside and we're all watching this, it was absolutely incredible. Um, and, uh, and, and it was very personal for me because those that follow me know that my, I, I have a spiritual number and it's 222. And that comes from second Timothy 222, uh, two, two, that says in the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So it's a discipleship verse, teach others to teach others. Well, so whenever I see 222, it's God winking at me. Well, the first day that I was in prison, I just so happened to be the 222nd inmate that day uh, that came in. So that was a big thing for me. When, when this eclipse came by in Marion, Illinois, the total uh, uh, eclipse time was two minutes and 22 seconds. So it was a really, really neat thing that God was doing for me uh, that I felt like, you know, personally. So I told myself, I'm not going to miss the next one. And I'm going to come right back to the very place that I was held captive, which by the way, uh, in Southern Egypt, where Marion is, that area is called Little Egypt. It's the only place in the United States uh, called uh, Little Egypt. I was held prisoner in Little Egypt, and, uh, and this solar eclipse came by. I didn't know anything prophetic about it, but I started studying it in prison. So fast forward now, seven years later to the day, April 8th is coming up uh, just a few days from now. And uh, I decided I, I'm going to do some homework on this. Well, I found that there were patterns. And that's one of my things I like to look for in scripture is patterns, 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 patterns. How does God speak? He always speaks in patterns. And uh, when I went back in history and found out that, that every single time 
that one of these total eclipses comes across uh, a country, one of two things typically happens. There is, a, there is, excuse me, there is either a war that happens shortly within 18 months uh, of the, those solar eclipses or an earthquake. And that began to get my attention because that doesn't even take in consideration what you mentioned, the blood red moons that all fall on biblical holidays of Passover and Sukkot, Passover and Sukkot, 1492. That was, was the first one. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition. Americans uh, look at that is when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They don't know that Columbus was Jewish. And the reason why he sailed on that day is because that was the day every Jew was required to get out of Spain. And, uh, and so Wait, that's- Wait, a... hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. Because that was- Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. That was I gonna... just blew up your world. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my question. Why did you say, you know, because you said something in the lines of, you know, Columbus was actually Jewish and that's actually a big thing and i wanted to ask you why but it's because he couldn't be in the country it's a spanish inquisition so american culture we never learned that in history you won't find that in the history books but the spanish inquisition uh in 1492 they were required to leave spain i think it was august 3rd if i recall properly it's in the video and that is the exact day that columbus left and every single person on his ship was jewish minus one uh was catholic uh if history is is true and so uh, th that brings a whole new color uh, to, to how America got founded and why. Uh, but at the end of the day, there was a solar eclipse uh, that, that happened, uh, a total solar eclipse that happened. The next time that doesn't happen, all the way now 500 years until you get to, four, uh, uh, excuse me, 1948, when Israel becomes a nation. And then 1967 and 68, when, when, when uh, the capital of Jerusalem, the Six Day War happens. And then 2014 and 15, when ISIS was formed and, and the Ebola virus breaks out and, and happens shortly after that in that time period. Now we're talking about total solar eclipses. And every time one of those happened, going all the way back to the War of Independence, there was a war, War of Independence, Civil War, Vietnam War, World War I. Uh, and so at the end of the day, and then, and then probably the greatest and scariest one is the one that happened in 1811. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen this video, you need to watch it because the only other time that an X ever came across the United States was in 1811, uh, 1806 and 1811, I think it was. And it formed an X over the Northeast. And uh, 90 days later, less than 90 days later, was the largest continental earthquake in the United States history. The New Madrid fault line broke open and it caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards and it rang the Liberty Bell. That's how powerful it was. They say that if that thing goes off today at the same level, it would send a 20 foot earth wave 200 miles in every direction, taking every building off its foundation instantly. That's how serious uh, this is. And there was a comet in the sky during that time. It just so happens that we've got an X over the United States directly now over the New Madrid fault line with another comet in the air. And the comet is called Devil's Comet. And it only comes around once every 71 years. So am I saying that, that something's going to happen? No, but I'm telling you that history, uh, historically, there are bad things that happened. By the way, the next thing that happened a few months later in 1811 was the War of 1812. Uh, so, it, it, and, and, I, and, I, and I just was told this yesterday, I didn't even catch it. They, World War II, I couldn't find one for World War II. No, the total solar eclipse for World War II was in Europe, which is where World War II was. Uh, so every time there has been a total solar eclipse, there has been either a war or and or an earthquake. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the things that I found re revolving around uh, April 8th. So why do you believe that things happen like that during Jewish feast? Yeah, that's a great question, Jennifer. And here's why. It goes back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And, and if we don't really read the front of the book from the author's perspective, we will fail by reading into it what we already believe. Let me give you a fantastic example. So in verse 14 of chapter one of Genesis, it says, and the Lord put the sun, moon, and the stars in the sky for signs and for seasons. Now, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't look into things, you're going to instantly think seasons. Oh, spring, summer, winter, fall, right? That's what seasons are. But in the Hebrew, it doesn't, it's not that word. It's the word moedim. And the word moedim, every person on the planet that speaks Hebrew knows what that means. It means the appointed feast days of the Lord. What? 
has nothing to do with there wasn't even spring summer winter or fall uh it was it was uh, like summertime all that's where the jurassic uh idea came from it, it, the earth was at a zero degrees and we didn't have these seasons at that point but at the end of the day he says i put the sun moon the stars in the sky so you'll know when to meet with me and what are these feast days they're all about Jesus. They're all about Yeshua. It's, it's Passover, unleavened bread, and, and the first fruits when he rose from the dead, and Pentecost, and trumpets, and Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. It's those seven holidays that are God's prophetic calendar of why he put that stuff in, in the sky. And then he also says it's for signs. And the fascinating part is the Hebrew word for signs there, Jennifer, is the word for warning. It's the word warning in Hebrew. It's omen is what it is. And that means that he put that stuff up there for warnings. Guess what happened the day that Jesus died? Come on. There was a solar eclipse and there was an earthquake that, tur that tore the temple curtain in half on oh, that And it was day. a Jewish holiday. E exactly. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was Passover. Okay. He just, uh, he dies on Passover, put in the, the grave during unleavened bread uh which and and then and then three days later in the first uh, first century that year just so happened to be yom bikarim first fruits now get this jesus is raising from the dead between 3 and 6 a.m we know that for a fact from the greek and at the exact point of time at the crack of dawn the high priest is standing uh with a barley sheaf that he just cut from the ground and he's waving it before god at sunrise asking god for a great harvest in the fall why, you, why Jesus, Yeshua, is being cut from the ground and is waving himself before the Father, asking for a great harvest of souls in the fall. It's unbelievable, uh, this stuff. It's not coincidence. God has a calendar. He's going by it to the book. And what did Satan do through the Roman church? Strip us of the calendar of our forefathers. It called it Jewish, which it's not. It's God's holy calendar for all of his people. And uh, the only ones that keep it typically are the Jewish people. And, uh, and they gave us a Roman calendar to, to totally keep us steered and looking in this direction while God is looking in this direction. And that's why when you get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when we always love to quote this verse, it says that he comes as a thief in the night. Oh, Pastor Jim, no one knows the day or the hour. That's right. But read the next verse, my friend, because the next verse says that only happens if you're walking in the dark. He says, that's but right. you do not walk in the dark, my friend. You are children of the light that these things will not come upon you mm -hmm. as a thief in the night. You will know the times and the seasons. That's right. And when you use that word in Jewish culture, that means feast days. And they knew when the Messiah was going to come back. And that's why all the Jewish people today, they know he's coming back on the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, even though they don't believe in Jesus, they know the Messiah is coming back on the Feast of Trumpets because in ancient Jewish culture, that's when they coronated kings is on the Feast of Trumpets. And you know what happens, uh, Jennifer, on the Feast of Trumpets? The king would come out. They put a crown on its head. Everyone bows on their knee and they declare him Lord. Unbelievable. That's why it Amen. says every knee will bow and confess that Yeshua is Lord because that's the ancient Israel culture. And it happens on the Feast of Trumpets. And when exactly is the Feast of Trumpets? So that is in, on the Hebrew calendar. It's called Tishrei 1. It's the seventh month. In our calendar, Gregorian calendar, it's the end of September, early October, somewhere in that area, normally in September. And it's what they call the fall feast. Yeah. It, today, in the, on the civil calendar in Judaism, they call it Rosh Hashanah. I and mean, your viewers might be familiar with that Rosh, term. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned, and I know like we're kind of sidetracked. I'm trying to sidetrack. I'm not trying to, but I am. You said in 2017, up until April 8th, of this year, it's going to be seven years to the T. Yes, it is. It's actually six years, six months, and six days uh, to the day that this, yeah, right, uh, that this this X is going to form. Now we keep calling it an X, uh, but in in God, God doesn't respect the English alphabet. He goes by His alphabet. And so if, if King David was alive today and he was looking at this, he would say, oh, that's the letter Tav. That's the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the letter Tav. And Tav is, is literally the word for mark. It means covenant, uh, perfect covenant. And, and if you take the, the another eclipse that happened in 2023 in October, by the way, first week of the Hamas-Israel uh, war, again, uh, and you overlay that with the 17 and the 24 eclipse, it literally forms the letter Aleph, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which means the strength of the leader. And so when you take the letter Aleph and you take the letter Tav together, that is the Aleph Tav, 
Jesus is the Aleph Tav in all of the scriptures. He is the Alpha Omega in Hebrew. It would have been Aleph Tav. He literally put his mark in the United States of America and dead center over little Egypt. And you know what's crazy, Jennifer? The last city that this eclipse goes through before it hits totality in little Egypt is Jacob City. You can't make this stuff up because Jacob was the one that went into Egypt that caused them to get uh, blessed and uh, become slaves all at the same time. So I believe that there is a warning that is going out to God's people, just like in every other solar eclipse, that if, it, if there's a reason why in second, uh, uh, um, um, Kings, it says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. Now we love to talk about the Democrats. We love to talk about the liberals and all the crazy people and sin, but God never addresses that. He addresses his people. And so that means that we're doing something that we need to probably introvertedly look into uh, and change our ways because they've become wicked. And that word wicked is not evil. In the Hebrew, it's wicked. It's good and evil mixed together like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so this eclipse is extraordinarily important. It's There's so much prophetic things connected to it. And we need to pay attention because something is going to happen in the spiritual realm that could manifest it in the physical realm, just like a child when it's conceived. Nobody knows until months later when things begin to change that you can point back. And I believe this solar eclipse is going to be that moment of conception of God beginning to operate in the earth realm in a, in a new way. So do you believe that it's going to be something good, something bad? Do you think that people are going to repent? What are your personal thoughts? It's, going to it's both. There's a lot of people mm. online talking about warning, warning, warning. I get that. And, and judgment, 100%. But as a, as a Bible academic and a historic, a historic a guy, the, the history is very clear. The worse the manifestation in the physical realm, the greater the revival. Uh, because this is what happens to God's people. We are lazy and it's just like kids, right? If you have kids, they will sit there and watch television all day long if you let them, right? <laughs> Until something cataclysmic happens and dad gets upset or mom says something, clean your room. Then everybody jumps up, TV's off, it's no problem. Uh, and I feel like that's kind of where we're at in Christianity. We become lazy. Uh, we're not doing Bible things in Bible ways. We are following the Gentile Roman church uh, calendar and we're missing all kinds of blessings. And, and we're just not going to wake up and, until something, and, we're, and on top of that, we're compromising. 80% of pastors are addicted to pornography. We're in an all-time low uh, in morality in the church, not outside the church, in the church. God's not considered about, you know, is not concerned about outside the church. Judgment starts in the house of God uh, for a reason. We're supposed to be the light. So uh, I really believe that two things are going to happen. I believe that if there is judgment coming uh, to America, there is time for us to repent. And I believe that a greatest revival is about to be sparked through this. There are more people looking into God things right now uh, than probably in the last decade because they're scared out of their mind with, with this a solar eclipse. They got the National Guard coming out in cities all over the country. P schools are shutting down. Like they're telling you to get more gas and more food. Why? This never happened before. And any toller didn't happen in 2017. And then you got CERN starting up their Hadron Collider on okay, April 8th. Jim, hold on one second. My mind is like mashed potato right now. Right. Okay. All right. So, Sorry, okay. it's like okay. a fire hydrant. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. So, whoa. Okay. So, all I didn't hear this. Okay. So, they're being told to stock up on gas now. I didn't hear that. I don't watch the news. Absolutely. Uh, the people, the news articles and, 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 uh, uh, programs are coming out all over the place, telling okay. people stock up on gas, uh -huh. stop, stock up on food. They got the National Guard coming out all over the country okay. for this eclipse. And, uh, and, and they're not saying why. And I personally believe it's because hundreds of thousands of terrorists have come through our, our southern mm -hmm. border. And there is a potential because there's going to be massive crowds of millions in, in one places, places all over the country. Mm -hmm. I think they're afraid out of their mind. Uh, and, and that's not to say anything about the spiritual realm mm -hmm. or what could happen, but the scientists and geologists and seismologists, they know that statistics, statistically, when you have this type of eclipse happen, which by the way, is a mathematical impossibility that the 2017 eclipse, the totality happens over uh, Southern Egypt, uh, little Egypt and Southern Illinois. And the 2024 eclipse totality happens in the exact same place. That's not even possible. It's not mathematically possible for both totalities to end up in the same place, in the same exact place. We're talking one single road that it points to 
which is Salem Road, which is the ancient name for Jerusalem in the Bible, right next to Devil's Kitchen Lake and Egypt Lake in Giant City National Park. You cannot make this up. They know it. They have a little bit of reservations that something could also happen because historically it does. And they're telling people, hey, be prepared. We don't know. Question. And then I want to get to something else that you just mentioned. What's so special about Little Egypt? Because you said right before the solar eclipse goes into its fullest state, it's going to hit Little Egypt before. Yeah, Jacob City before it I'm goes sorry, into Jacob Little... City. Yeah. yeah. So what's so special about that? Why does that matter? So it, it matters for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, the whole entire Exodus story starts in Egypt, where God calls his people out of Egypt at Passover. Now, what's incredible about this eclipse is it's happening on Nisan 1. What's Nisan 1, Pastor Jeff? Nisan 1 is the first day on God's prophetic calendar. So his, his New Year's is on Nisan 1. 14 days later, his son died on a cross on Passover. All right. And so this day is also the day where Nehemiah left uh, Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. And it's also the day that they cleansed the temple after it was defiled uh, in the time of Solomon. And so this day, historically, God has set apart for rebuilding, uh, uh, cleaning, and for Exodus, getting his people out of Egypt. And so the whole story of, of the Passover and Egypt revolves around this time period right now. And so the solar eclipse is happening at the exact same time that God said in the Old Testament, this is the day I'm choosing to cleanse my temple. And God says that judgment starts in the household of God. And I believe this solar eclipse is a prophetic warning saying, now is the time you better cleanse your temple. This is the time. The Bible says that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the time. Passover is coming. The blood of the lamb is going to be posted again, and I need my people to come out of Egypt again. It's the time where God's people need to prophetically come out of Egypt. Now, the next question should be, what is today's Egypt? It's the tradition and doctrines of men. That's what it is. That, that's what we, we've integrated into early Christianity, Roman customs that come right out of paganism. And I look, I, I just got to say this because the audience doesn't know, but the word Easter alone is comes from Ishtar of the Bible. It was a pagan holiday in Rome uh, to the goddess Ishtar. And, and the Roman Constantine emperor just said, hey, let's take this and let the people still celebrate on this day, on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, but let's just make it for Jesus. We're literally using the name of a pagan goddess and we don't even know it and we're and, we're, and associated with it with the resurrection of Christ. It's mind blowing. So we've got to get to a place, I believe, where God says, look, you got to come out of Egypt. It's not your fault. You don't know this. No more than the people that grew up slaves in Egypt never knew what freedom was. They had no idea what the Israelite God was all about. He had to reintroduce himself to Moses and say, listen, Moses didn't even know his name. And we've come to that place where how many Christians that I meet across the planet, they don't even know the name of Jesus in his original Hebrew tongue. How is it possible that we don't even know the name of Jesus of what Mary called him? We don't even know it. We only know the English version, Jesus. We don't know it's Yeshua. That's the shirt that I have on right now. And shockingly, you know what Yeshua means, Jennifer, in Hebrew? It's the Hebrew word for salvation. Unbelievable. So we've got to get to a place where we're coming out of Egypt. And I think that's what this warning is all about. Amen. Amen. So when you say that God is calling his people out of Egypt, how do you believe he's calling them out of Egypt? I know. So we have this solar eclipse, but how do you think he's calling them out? Yeah. I mean, my experience over two decades of, of doing this kind of work of, of teaching Christians, the roots of their faith, uh, removing Protestantism ideas, which just are glorified Catholic ideas, Roman ideas, and going back to doing Bible things in Bible ways. What I've discovered is, is lives radically changed families totally healed because when they begin to go, okay, let's just audit our life right now. Family, let's, let's have a meeting. What are we doing? Uh, and what can we, and, and is there anything that we're doing that we can't find in the Bible? Is there anything that we can't find in the Bible? Because we probably shouldn't be doing holidays that either are forbidden in scripture or not found in scripture, right? And we probably should be doing 
uh, things that the disciples did and encouraged them. You know, most people don't know in first Corinthians chapter five, you know, we're coming up on Passover and I've got 700 people coming to a Passover uh, uh, weekend uh, down in the Lake of the Ozarks. So I can, I can say this, but first Corinthians chapter five, Paul says this to the Corinth church, who is a bunch of pagans that just got saved. And he says, look, when you keep the feast of Passover, I don't want you to do it with, with malice or drunkenness. I want you to do it in sincerity and truth. He's literally expecting the Corinthian church made up a bunch of Gentiles to celebrate the resurrection on Passover. This is what the church did. Now, I know it's kind of controversial and some of your viewers might be, oh my gosh, you know, he's crazy. But no, it, this is true. It's right out of your Bible. So the fastest way for us to come out of Egypt is literally to begin to look at God's calendar and get on it because it's like a time watch. If, you, if, if you're not synced up with the right time, you will be late. It's just like these silly uh, 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 time zones that we have in the United States. Like we're, we're crazy. Like I'm doing interviews at three o'clock Eastern. I got to like do the math in my head. And sometimes I'm an hour off. Like, I, I like, oh man, I'm sorry. I forgot. I had to subtract four and add two and square it to know what time I'm supposed to be meeting. If you're not on God's time clock that he said in Genesis 4 and 14, this is why I put the sun, moon, and the sky in the air for, to, for times and for holy days. If we're not on his time block, we're going to miss incredible blessings. So right now we're on a Roman holiday calendar. What we should be on is a biblical holy day calendar. There's a big difference. And it should be a massive red flag to anybody that loves Jesus, that the world is celebrating the same holidays that we celebrate. How can a pagan be celebrating holidays that we celebrate and they don't even love God? That should be the first inclination that maybe we're doing something wrong if we're attracting pagans and atheists to celebrate the same holidays that we're celebrating. Something can't be right. They should, the Bible says we're different. The world hates us. And that's actually one of the marks that you're doing the right thing is that you are going in the opposite direction. You know, I love the opening to The Chosen, if you've seen it, right? It's got all the fish swimming in one direction, and then one at a time, the fish turn around and go in the opposite direction. It's how you know you're doing uh, Bible things in Bible ways. The world doesn't want anything to do with anything that's really authentic. So there's a massive move, Jennifer, of millions of people around the world that are starting to go, you know what, I, I'm going to still celebrate the resurrection, but I'm going to do it the way the disciples did it. And they're seeing an ex no bunnies, no eggs, no magical toys, no telling your kids, oh, it's not what it means. You know, this is not what it really means. It's about Jesus. We don't have to tell them that because the whole thing is authentic. So that is a one way, probably the most powerful way I've seen incredible supernatural things happen with people that begin to go back and go, man, you know what? I'm just going to start doing what the Bible says. How did these early Christians do this before Rome got involved? Forget about your theology. Forget about what people told you about what you should do or not do. Just be simple about it. The disciples did it. They encouraged their followers to do it. That should be good enough for us. Amen. Amen. Now you mentioned something earlier that I think people, when they heard it, piqued their interest. And I think they're still holding on to it. You said when there was an X across the United States in the 1800s, that it was a large earthquake and it even rung the Liberty Bell. Now, yeah. if it were to happen again, it would be a tsunami. Is that what yeah. you meant? Is that what you said? Okay. So a lot of people for the past probably 10 years have been having dreams about a tsunami mm. occurring on the East Coast. Have you heard that? And then some even on the West near California. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. And you know, what's really crazy. You just triggered something inside of me. It, when I was in prison between me and, and five other people, uh, I had never had this be before happen. I, I really wasn't very super prophetic when I, when I went into prison, I, 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 I had been given the gift of uh, pr prophetic and, and like, but I, I really wasn't operating a hundred percent. In prison, we had over 300 prophetic dreams, uh, visitations, crazy prophetic visions. My daughter was seeing visions with her eyes opening like Narnia. The whole wall opened up. Angels showed up. Crazy stories. Um, but I only had nine of myself. My daughter had 72 just herself. She's crazy prophetic. I had nine dreams. Every single one of them were about tsunamis. Every one of them. Every one of them. was a, a, Every single one was a tsunami and a flood. 
And, um, and so I, I didn't think of that until you just uh, said that. And, and oftentimes tsunamis are created by what? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Yeah. So it's very possible. Uh, my daughter actually lives in Naples, Florida, and she called me. She said, dad, um, we're coming up on, on, on April 8th. <laughs> I, I don't want to be here. I just lived yeah. through a hurricane. I don't want to see a tsunami, right? So wow. it is possible. We don't know, it, but it is possible. Our own personal family, like we are taking this serious. Like we're mm -hmm. not going to mock God and we're not going to mock history. We are getting together extra food. We have dried food. We have a solar generator. We have a water purifier. Um, and we're stocking up stuff in our camper, like just in case it, the ants are wise because they provide, they prepare in the summertime. So I, I think it's wise because if it doesn't, if nothing happens, great. If something does, I'm going to be very grateful. My children will be grateful that I was a responsible dad uh, to think through some of this stuff. So do you think it could happen on that day or a few weeks or months after? So Just nothing, like many of the, the, the only time I could ever find anything that happened on the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of a solar eclipse was two times in history, both are insane. Uh, one at the time of Christ, okay? So the, the, literally on the day he died, there was a solar eclipse and an earthquake. And then shockingly, when Jonah went to Nineveh, okay, NASA has recorded a solar eclipse uh, over, of, over Nineveh. And so th there was their warning. Now, nothing happened. You know why? They repented. That's right. Okay? So there, a lot of people don't know this, but God does change his mind. He does. As a matter of fact, Moses was on top of the mountain. And what did God say? He said, Mo, get out of my way. I'm killing everybody and giving everything to you. Uh, and Moses talked him out of it. He said, God, you can't do this. And, and God's like, okay, good point. Uh, I, I won't kill him this time, you know. <laughs> but so God can stay his hand, even if he makes a proclamation, it's dependent on our repentance. So this does not mean America is going to fall off into oblivion and be destroyed. It means that God's people need to repent. We need to be, this is a warning for us. We are Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the two, 2024 eclipse is going through two of the six Ninevehs in complete totality. Uh, and, and the reason, and the other four are right outside the totality. And prophetically, the Holy Spirit shared with me, Jim, the reason why I didn't go through all six of Nineveh's is because two of them, two of your lights are out. Two of your candlesticks are completely dark. The other ones are dim, but they still have light there. There is a chance. And the reason why that's really important metaphor that I just gave is because the menorah in the temple was a seven branched candlestick. Technically, it's only six because the center one is called the servant candle, the Shamash candle, which represents Christ. It's six branches, the number of man with the seven. Uh, and so at the end of the day, there's six Ninevehs, two of our candles are out. And I believe God has given us a chance to repent. Will something happen on the day? Likely not. Everything has happened in history, typically happened within that seven year period. Over 90% happen within 18 months. So I am looking for something to happen within 18 months. And with Israel just striking Damascus and taking out their embassy, the Iranian embassy, and, and Iran promising to retaliate, this could go into a world war immediately. Like this could happen after the solar eclipse where the whole Middle East turns on fire. We don't know. You know, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because people will be expecting things to happen literally on that day. But usually it doesn't happen, like you said, on that day. It happens within a certain period within that time. So I have one more question for you or another question for you. You mentioned, and I cut you off, but you mentioned that they're doing a lot of stuff actually on April 8th. It's not just the solar eclipse. Could you tell us everything you're doing? Because people may be shocked. It's not just, oh, let's look at the sky. Let's look at the sun go over the moon or what? Okay. Could you tell everybody what else is happening? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you want all the details, definitely go to our YouTube channel at Passion for Truth Ministries and look for that video. You'll see it. Uh, it's 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 right up there. It's of all the things that are happening on, on April 8th. So I'll just go through them quickly. Of course, you have the eclipse. We've been talking about that. Uh, lesser known is CERN. Now CERN, uh, which is in CERN, Switzerland, uh, is a, a 17 mile underground, 300 feet underground tube, Hadron Collider, where all the top scientists in the world 
are going to be taking two electrons and they're running them at the at seven miles an hour from the speed of light in opposite directions. And they're firing it up on all days. They're firing it up on April 8th and they want to collide these two uh, 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 atoms and, and make them explode so that they can find the dark matter. That's They want to find out, get this, Jennifer, this is crazy. Scientists want to know what's holding the universe together. It's called like, Jesus. It's very simple. You just said it. It's Jesus. It's the word of God, right? But they know it's dark matter. There's something holding and they want to get, get uh, figure out what that is and capture it. Now, what's really happening uh, is that they want to open up the time space continuum. There's not really any evolution that's at the top uh, of the tier anymore. It doesn't exist. They're not. They know it's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, they have found the spiritual realm. They have found it. They know there's other dimensions and they're trying to get into it. As a matter of fact, let me give you this quote. This is incredible. This is a quote by uh, from, let's see, who is this guy? This is Sergio Bertolucci. He's the director for research and scientific computing at CERN. He says, quote, something may come through dimensional doors at the Hadron Collider and out of this door might come something or we might send something through it. They're trying to basically find out how to go back in time. They're trying to bend time and figure out how the universe started. The problem with that is you can create a miniature black hole they don't know what could happen if that happens. They also don't know what's going to come through. So that's happening on April 8th. Uh, what else do we have? We have, here's what else we got. NASA is launching three ships into outer space to observe this solar eclipse. And the name of the mission is the APEP mission, named after the serpent deity of ancient Egypt, which is the nemesis of Ra, the sun god, where the serpent deity APEP eats the sun. Okay. Yes. So you can't make this stuff up. That's happening on April 8th. On April 8th, we, we, in, that in that time period, we have the cicadas coming out. This is the double brood of two different types of cicadas. The locusts are coming out of the ground simultaneously by the billions. It's going to cover the entire Midwest and South uh, uh, part of the United States. Wait, are you serious? Wait, so- I'm I'm dead serious. You guys can look this up online. Wow. You'll see it everywhere by the billions. News organizations are talking about it everywhere in those states. Uh, it's going to cover, I think, 17 states. The last time this happened was 1803. This doesn't happen. It's never happened in our lifetime or our father's or our father's father's lifetime. 1803. And they're coming out by the billions like a plague out of the ground. There is going to be a comet aligning uh, with five other uh, planets on April 8th. And the comet's name is Devil's Comet. And it hasn't been here in 71 years. Same, same circumstances back in 1811 when we had two solar eclipses and a comet in the sky when the, uh, the New Madrid Fault went off. Uh, the National Guard is being deployed. And, and this is crazy. The Red Heifer, they're planning on sacrificing the Red Heifer in Israel, which... You know, I don't know if you've been talking about, but your viewers should for sure be educated on that. The Antichrist desecrates the temple, according to Daniel chapter nine and all prophecy. And that starts the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of mankind. Well, you can't stop a sacrificial system that hasn't started yet. And if you know the front of the book, the only way to start a temple sacrifice is through a cleansing ritual cleansing process. And you have to have the ashes of a red heifer to do that. And for the first time in over 2,000 years, they have pure bred red heifers uh, without a single gray hair, white hair on them. And they're, they're planning on sacrificing them this year, hopefully around Passover. And I've got some friends that are in Israel that are connected with that. And I'm going to verify when exactly they're going to do this. Because when they do that, and they already have the altar built, they already have all the utensils, they have everything, even the priests were born uh, at home 20 years ago had been groomed for this moment. And when that happens, it's going to open up the pages of history like 1948 when Israel was born. And it's only a matter of time before then they start the daily sacrifice, which then really will wake up God's people because it's very short time period after that where the temple sacrifices get stopped. And then the rest of hell is unleashed on earth. Wow. So do you believe that that's going to start the tribulation? It's, it's not a belief. It's the, it's the Bible. Like there's not even debate on that. Like, like it literally begins the last three and a half years on earth when the antichrist is revealed. Wow. Okay. So what would you, what would you tell everyone watching now? Some people are afraid now. 
which God has not given you the spirit of fear. Yeah. What would you tell those right now watching who are concerned about April 8th? Because God has told people not to have the spirit of fear. He did not give that, that spirit. So yeah. what would you say to encourage those right now who are saying, okay, I don't want to be afraid, but I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. Do I stock up? I don't have enough money to stock up. I don't have this. You know, what would, what comfort would you give them? Yeah. You know, I, the same comfort I gave my daughters, right? So, so my daughters, some of them aren't married yet. And they're like, dad, I want to get married. Is the end of the world coming? My 11 year old comes up and says, dad, I don't want the end of the world to happen. And uh, I, I want to go swimming first this summer, you know? And, uh, and so look, as much as this kind of is scary, the end of the world is meant to invoke a reverent introspection into our spiritual lives and go, wow, like fear can be a healthy thing. Like God has not given us a spirit of fear, but it's of, a, of a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And you know what, what warnings do? They, they wake you up to have a sound mind. So yes, brother, sister, we don't need to walk in fear. But we do need to walk in reverence to realize that maybe nothing will happen on 8th, April 8th. Maybe nothing will happen for the next year. Maybe nothing will happen for the next 10 years. But if this is an opportunity for us to check ourselves and make sure that we're not living in sin, we're not living in compromise, and that we're seeking God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, then this is a healthy place to be and recognize that God always wins, period. Like win. He win we are on the winning team if you are, if you are wearing his jersey. And then two, this is the moment that God's been waiting for, for 2000 years to get his people ready to have the greatest revival we've ever seen. So as much as we say, oh man, what could happen? How do I prepare? Look, do the best that you can and trust God with the rest. Because if you're in the middle of his will, I can promise you that's the best place to be. So don't have any kind of fear, but be reverently respectful of the times that we're living in, because it leads to revelation. It leads to restitution being paid, uh, and it leads to a greater awakening. And we need this moment. We need God's people to get back uh, to where, a place where we used to be the head and not the tail. Amen. Amen. I love this interview. I loved it. Before we end in prayer, I would like to tell everyone, check out Bold Faith Tees. Come Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit it. Come. I love this shirt. They're a new uh, Christian t-shirt company and they are bold for Christ, make amazing t-shirts. So please check them out, boldfaithtees.com. Now, Jim Staley, could you do us a favor? Could you end this out in prayer and could you add in there comfort for yes. those who need that, you know, comfort from Holy Spirit right now to know that they will be, the Lord will protect them. They will yes. be okay. And, and, and before I pray, I, I do, I do just want to say that again, God is on the throne. Amen. He loves you. You don't have anything to fear. A message like this is designed to kind of get you frazzled a little bit mm -hmm. so that you'll go to the Lord and bridge the gap, go to him in prayer. He is your peace. He is your Shalom. He is your rock. He is the provider. He is all of those things. He will be those things. Do not let the spirit of fear or doubt come into your life. Be sober, open-minded to what God is doing and get excited because God's about to work in your life. The solar eclipse is going to be beautiful, by the way, on, on a practical side. I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go see it. Uh, I encourage you to go see it. It's going to be an amazing experience. Okay, before we pray, I'm sorry. Could you just let everyone know where they can find you? If they haven't seen your video, if they don't know your channel, what's the best way for everyone to reach you? Yes, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel at Passion for Truth Ministries. The channel name is Passion for Truth Video, uh, or you can go to passionfortruth.com. Very simple, passionfortruth.com. We have hundreds of videos. Uh, we even have free downloads uh, that you can uh, you can get everything that you want to. If you want to learn more about the feast days, uh, you can you can learn more about that. So. Anything that you want to learn Bible wise in that area, anything interest we talked about, it's all there uh, and you can visit us. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together. We just love you. We glorify you. We're so grateful that you are on our side. And Lord, there is, we come up against a Goliath, whether it be in the physical realm, spiritual realm, or whether it be even in the stars and crazy things happening in the earth. Lord, that, that there is no Goliath that your rock of your salvation can't take down. 
And so we're grateful, Lord. And Lord God, I just want to call out to anybody that that doesn't know you right now, that they get right with you, that they accept your son into their life. They begin to seek you with all of their heart and, and turn from their wicked ways. God, we love you and we praise you. We ask that you would be with your people around the world, that you would wake us up, that you would open up our hearts, Lord, to going back and looking at the ancient pathways and begin to alter our life and do Bible things in Bible ways, Lord. Give us revelation, heal our relationships, God. Bring children back to their fathers. Lord, bring relationships back together that have been broken. And God, I just sense right now that there's someone that's out there that is in the middle of a divorce right now. They are literally in the middle of it right now. And God, I pray that you would give them the comfort, the wisdom, and the discernment. And if you have any possible way to restore that relationship, I pray that you would do it. God, in the same way, your people who have been called by your name have been separated from you and they don't even know it. Would you bring a restoration of your people back into an intimate connection that would usher in the greatest power revival we have ever seen in this country and around the world? We love you. We praise you. We thank you for being in control. In the name of your great son, Jesus, Yeshua, amen. Amen and amen. Jim Staley, I want to thank you again for this interview, and I would love to have you back on because it seems like you're a wealth of knowledge and you love the Lord, which is very important. So, hey, man, um, thank, thank you for you. having me, Jennifer. This was definitely fun on my end. Mine as well. God bless you, Jim. All right. Shalom, shalom. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.